In my presentation, I will not refer too much to climate change because all the presentations before have done this. So um, let me first have a little um, prologue and preface. Usually in a book, a preface is something written. And may I use this photograph that has been taken from the International Space Station um, in 2011, uh, the space station cruising over Africa and uh, showing planet Earth burning, a sort of daily routine that can be observed. And maybe this picture alone tells us a lot about the global nature or the transboundary nature of fire as um, we are going down to the science. It, it takes a bit longer to do a global analysis um, a snapshot by camera takes a few seconds. And this book, Mike, Vegetation Fires and Global Change, is a white paper that we have compiled with the contribution of 52 most prominent scientists of the world. It took us four years to get that analysis together. And it has been published now. And since one of the leading co-authors is with us, Mike, I would like to hand over to you the first copy of this book. Um, why is fire a global issue? Um, the view from space, as um, was seen on the first photograph, also depicted by satellite sensors, uh, shows that the magnitude of fires are large, often much larger than admitted by governments, like uh, here a very typical situation of spring fires in the region um, east of Baikal Lake and the smoke transport coming out of these fires, traveling uh, to the east over Japan, to Alaska, North America, Europe, and finally coming back to the Russian Federation. Um, while clearly climate change, we have seen it very clearly this morning in the presentation, is um, a key issue, an important issue for planning for the future, we shall not forget that at moment, Fire regimes globally and also in the future will be determined by human activities. And if we are looking to the statistics in Europe, it is very clear that in the average, 97 to 99% of the fires are caused by people. They are not caused by weather or climate. So it's people. And we think that globally, 90% of the fires that are causing, let me say, problems or negative impacts are caused by humans. So it's on the one side very clear. We have the recorded warming as shown on the picture. We have seen that before. We have the climate models that are telling us about the potential of fires in the future. But if we are looking, and now I'm picking two examples um, where we have quite of opposite movements in the world the example of regions where people are still colonizing natural vegetation, converting forests because they are looking for livelihood and survival. So it is a trend out of the cities to the forest wildlands. And the other trend is um, what is happening here in Europe. It's the other way around. People are urbanizing and both trends, their opposite direction have effects on fire. But if we stay with equatorial Asia, the massive amount of burning that's still ongoing for converting native vegetation into, for instance, palm oil plantations, that's a driving factor and determining the composition of the atmosphere. It's all the people that are using fire in ecosystems that in conjunction with other uses like overgrazing, um, inappropriate cutting or non-sustainable forestry are causing lots of damages. Many of them are secondary damages like um, landslides, mudslides, 
and um, fires are encroaching the higher altitude ecosystems. We can see this in the South American Andes. We see it in the Himalaya Hindu Kush region where the smoke plumes from fires, as recorded by the satellite here from the Nepalese Himalayas, have never seen before, but uh, they are coming now increasingly. And it's not just the fires that are burning. They are very much affecting um, the livelihood of people, the infrastructure, and so on. And we will see similar threats in the European Alps in our region. The other way around, people are urbanizing here in Europe. Eric Rigolo has shown the statistics of uh, population development of land use change. So having more lands that are abandoned, more forests, less fragmentation. Let me give you some examples like this, uh, these photographs from Spain showing the same site in 1950 and 2001. All over Europe in the old cultivated landscapes, there was hardly anything to burn for wildfires because it was intensively cultivated. And by purpose or accidentally, because we have large areas of fallow, the forest is coming in. So the forest fire problem here in large parts of Europe is a human-made, a self-made, a society-made problem. And it is not so much climate-driven, at least for the moment. And you see that either villages, like on the Balkans, are completely abandoned, or the former pasture lands are overgrown by forest, and thus the old barriers, the old big fuel breaks, um, are now disappearing. And that brings us to the question uh, that has been discussed, discussed before, will we have potentially larger fires in future? Yes, because the conditions are there. And the people who have been intensively utilized biomass, all kinds of biomass, from the cork to the wood, to the small materials, to build all kinds of goods. That's not existent anymore. So let us have a look to the eastern region, where this problem is becoming even much more massive. <coughs> In the two decades of the 90s and early 2000s, about seven, 27 million hectares of agricultural land in the Russian Federation went out of production. And in 2010, about 3,000 villages in Russia were more or less closed, abandoned. Very often only a few very old people are staying behind. But there is nobody continuing to cultivate the land and not to say nobody who is able to defend what is there, you know, like the rural assets, the villages, or the remaining field. Then we have another problem. All over Europe, if we are talking about vegetation or natural vegetation, we have a lot of intermix of the heritage of our civilization. So when wildfires are burning in these sites at the interface of our industrial landscape with all the remnants the waste deposits, or even the structures that are affected by fire, which contain numerous materials that burn differently, like toxic um, uh, compounds that are released by these wildfires. And, and these emissions that are coming from the mix of natural fuel types and the emissions from artificial, from plastic, even up to radioactivity, are now becoming a part of a problem. There are a number of attempts to uh, quantify the damages of fire. And using, in the last global assessment report by the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, uh, the TAPE methodology was applied and came up with an annual loss uh, non-accumulated of about close to 200 billion US dollars per year of damages of ecosystem services damaged by fire. And uh, considering that uh, the recovery period of many forests uh, affected by fire or other land vegetation types affected by fire uh, takes some time, 
this loss could amount to several trillion dollars per year. This is a model. We have lots of models, like this climate change model, but there's always a little bit reality and truth behind this model. And I, all what I want to say is, we are talking about dimensions of economic and ecological damage, which normally, if you would have this somewhere else, would justify investment. Investment by our political systems in order to encounter this development. And if we are looking to the humans alone, we are now at the Global Fire Monitoring Center compiling, uh, it's a very painful work, you know, the, the people injured or killed by fires globally, and we have just released, not yet published, um, the 2012 figures. Uh, you can see that um, this is in the magnitude of several hundred people per year. Of course, this is much less than compared to what happens in the tsunami. But um, if we are already looking here to the numbers in 2010, which the 280 fatalities do not include the approximate 56,000 people who died in Western Russia as a consequence of the severe heat and smoke pollution period, there are no statistics that tell us how many premature deaths were due to heat stress or due to smoke pollution or both combined. But it is a fact. If we have an extreme fire episode in this region, it happens at high temperatures to which uh, the humans are not really used to in the region. And if this is mixing with the smoke pollution, you may remember what happened three years ago. Uh, since 2011, we are also monitoring the other economic damages like houses destroyed, people evacuated, because evacuations alone, and uh, um, in 2012 it was uh, almost 120,000, with a big gray area of those uh, that we did not capture. It is also enormous economic value and has also a kind of humanitarian dimension. So who are those who are not able to cope with fire? We are very privileged here in Europe. Um, and through the in initiative of the Entente, it is very clear that progresses have been made to control fire. But in the media, you never learn about the hundreds and thousands of people getting homeless, villages are destroyed, somewhere between Africa and Latin America and Asia. And one of the um, main objectives of the work, which uh, I will refer later again, is to empower, to enable these local communities. This is where usually the fires are starting, but this is where the people are most affected by fire, that they will be empowered to defend themselves and to manage fire properly. 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 In general, many countries are quite well organized <coughs> in organizing uh, fire prevention and control in the settlements and the cities. This is the task of the structural fire services. Many countries are well organized in protecting forests, but there's a huge vacuum globally in the agricultural lands. And this is actually in the agricultural lands, this is where the fires are starting. Most fires don't start inside the forest. They are starting outside in the agricultural lands. And uh, this is where we have to um, put emphasis. Because pictures like these, this large-scale burning of pastures and field, this is here in Armenia and the South Caucasus, is uh, very common. And this is reflected by the satellite imagery, which shows, for instance, the spring fires. And these are agricultural and pasture fires. These are not forest fires. Spring fires occurring between March and May, in this case in the years 2006 and 2007. And it shows a pretty clear boundary because these fires are burning east of the European Union. In the European Union, we hardly have these signals depicted by satellite. And that brings us to a region 
where these fires do not only affect, um, well, the ecosystems, many of these fires are set by purpose <coughs> to clean agricultural sites, but there are collateral damages because at this specific time of the year, we have a south to north flow of air masses that are transporting these emissions to the Nordic environment, to the Arctic environment. And this is where the black carbon, the soot that is coming out of the fire is deposited on the Arctic ice shield. These fine particles, which can sometimes be seen uh, like on this uh, photo of Greenland, but this is an exemption, this is a very extreme case, but many of these particles cannot be seen, but they are contributing to a rapid melting of the ice and snow cover in the region. So again, the individual farmer somewhere in Ukraine or somewhere in Russia Um, these local fires that may serve local interests of people, they have a transboundary, they have a global impact. So how to address this? This is not easy. In uh, the region of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, we have a so-called team of specialists on forest fire, which has been founded around 1980. And uh, this team of specialists... Um, in the 1980s and 1990s um, addressed these global interlinkages of fire and um, recommended to establish a couple of instruments. One of them is the Global Fire Monitoring Center, which uh, came out as an activity of this UNECE team of specialists. Uh, this is the Global Fire Monitoring Center. If somebody is interested, I have a brochure. We are located in Freiburg in Germany. And a few years later, um, the Global Wildland Fire Network was founded with, uh, meanwhile, 14 regional networks that are regional entities to work with this global center to address um, the questions of the transboundary nature of fire and uh, to identify the resulting problems and how and the possible solutions. So about 10 years ago, um, in a first meeting in the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, the question of international cooperation um, in fire emergencies was addressed, followed um, by a regional conference in the Russian Federation, and will now end up in a regional forum at the United Nations level that will be convened end of November in Geneva. And the goal is, uh, through the participation of the UN ECE member states, to um, define um, possible approaches, possible pathways um, for development of an agreement, which uh, in the beginning very clearly will be a voluntary agreement on cross-boundary fire management, an agreement not only um, focusing on the UNEC region, but globally. And the objective of the agreement would be, given the fact that there are countries on the one side that have developed the science, the managerial skills, and the technological systems to manage fire quite successfully, the majority of countries in the UNECE region, the greater European region, I mean, UNECE, that's 56 member states. Um, and globally, the majority of the about 180 to 190 nations globally is not in the position to have control over fire in the largest sense. So what is needed is assisting countries in building capacity in fire management and especially those countries that are only occasionally confronted with fire, especially, coming back to the question this morning, uh, countries that have not experienced for a long time a large fire, and there is no expertise to handle that situation. The benefits of this 
uh, forum will be global. Uh, we have invited and have already agreement of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, of the Southern African Development Community, and so on, to attend the forum. And I hope that we will be able to report about some of the critical questions that we need to address. One of them, um, I indirectly already talked about, it is the question of uh, long-range transport of air pollutants. We have a convention. It's a UNECE convention that is addressing the long-range transport of pollutants, but it is not including the pollutants from fires, only industrial pollute pollution. The Gothenburg Protocol has recently included the black carbon into um, this convention, but still uh, the fires are not explicitly mentioned. We have a European landscape convention uh, under the auspices of the Council of Europe where fire is not addressed. And fire is a, an important factor in landscapes. We have a convention on the conservation of European wildlife and natural habitats, the Bern Convention. It does not address fire, although fire is a very determining factor for wildlife. But now we have the process going on about the legally binding agreement on forests in Europe, which uh, will have a conference of the parties next month. And this will be a possible entry point for an agreement in fire management. So what we need to address is fire, not only of the point of view of area burned or reduce the number of fires, but we have to look at human health and security. We have to look how much, and that brings us to the other convention like the UNFCCC, uh, what are the impacts and how impacts can be mitigated concerning atmosphere and climate, and the mentioned uh, uh, elements like landscape patterns, uh, biodiversity, and so on. Fire has a very cross-sectoral nature. If you go to a country and you ask who is responsible for the fire, Sometimes you get the reply and the answer, yeah, it's our fire service. Sometimes you get the answer, it's the forest service. But then there's the Ministry of Health and says, oh, well, it's a health issue. And so on. It's a human security issue. So um, we need to come away from the sectoral thinking. We need to look at fire as a very determining global factor that has impact on many sectors of environment and society. So in the end, I would like to show, just to show to you some um, impressions of the work in the regions, because this network um, tries to foster um, international cooperation in the neighborhood of uh, regions. As I said, uh, there are 14. And we are trying to decentralize the work because at the Global Fire Monitoring Center, it's a relatively small unit. Um, we are becoming a little bit overwhelmed with work. And uh, now we are decentralizing by building regional fire monitoring centers. And uh, the first one, which was established in 2009 in the Southeast Europe uh, region, has already shown uh, progress <coughs> and advances of bringing countries in the region together to do joint training, like in this picture in Antalya, where about five or six countries from the Balkan and three countries from Caucasus and Russia work together. And these countries are using uh, the Eurofire standards that have been developed under the EU Leonardo program. And the Eurofire standards, and here's a screenshot of, of the website, is meanwhile, are meanwhile available in seven languages, and uh, soon three languages will follow in November. That's Ukrainian, uh, Macedonian, and Greek. And these are standards for training the level two firefighter. And we have noted that after using them and applying them in these international training courses, the firefighters, the responsible authorities, get a better feeling of working together because they're using the same language and the same methodologies. 
So these are just some examples how, in this case, in Armenian, the fire uh, standards are applied. The Armenian Fire and Rescue Service uh, that is in charge of, um, of uh, firefighting in the country, like in most European countries, are uh, using them. And these are services that, meanwhile, are trained with the basics in fire ecology and fire behavior and so on that they normally do not learn in their academies. And it includes the use of prescribed fire. Uh, some of you may smile when they see these little flames in this uh, demonstration burn. Yes, it is a demonstration burn in Russia, where last year, for the first time in history, it was officially allowed, even with the presence of the media, to put a very, very little prescribed fire, just to show the principles. And that already was some progress. Eastern Europe has created its uh, new regional fire monitoring center in Kiev in Ukraine, and that center is explicitly concentrating on fires burning on contaminated terrain, like uh, the terrain that was contaminated by radioactivity uh, after the Chernobyl incident. Uh, so that is a special task uh, for this. And we have also interregional network cooperation like in Asia with the colleagues from Korea have taken the lead to bring uh, four regions together in a cluster where constant exchange is taking place. So, summary. Uh, what we want to do through the Global Wildland Fire Network, facilitated by our center, we want to develop common international principles or standards in fire management. We want to develop this year, starting in Geneva, a proposal for a global agreement on cross-boundary or transboundary cooperation in fire management. We would like to foster the exchange Countries that need experience from other countries should have the opportunity to do so. And to do it through common regional training would be one solution. And of course, we would like to contribute to develop international policies that are addressing global change in fire. And again, I'm saying global change is not only climate change, it's also change of society and land use. That was my message. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions.